everyone, my name is Renelle and I'd like to welcome you to Parramatta Church this morning. Even though we are tuning into our live stream, I hope that you are blessed by the service today. The last couple of weeks have been quite challenging and overwhelming for a lot of us, but in Psalm 16 verse 8, we are reminded that the Lord is with us wherever we go and whatever we do. So I hope you are blessed by this promise. Oh, hey. Hey. What are you doing? Learning the ukulele. When did you have time to learn the ukulele? In isolation. Ah, okay. I'm not the only one learning cool things in isolation. Check out these youth and what they're doing. How do I spend my time in isolation? Working from home and trying not to eat all the food in the fridge. So let's go see how Daniel's spending his isolation time. It is currently 11 a.m. I'm still currently working and also trying to, you know, keep a safe distance from everyone these past few crazy weeks and also just enjoying Sabbath school on Zoom and trying to, you know, stay connected with everyone with social media. <laughs> there's praise and then there's high praise. Praise is a discipline, yet high praise is a delight. And in Psalms 145, David moves from a duty of praise into an ecstasy of high praise. He says that his heart is overwhelming and exploding with praise. And he cannot take in how utterly amazing God is in his goodness, in his glory, and his awesome acts of power. David's heart bubbles over as he meditates on God's excellent greatness. In Psalms 145, verses 6 to 7, in the Passion Translation, David says this, your awe-inspiring acts of power have everyone talking. I'm telling people everywhere about your excellent greatness. Our heart bubbles over as we celebrate the fame of your beauty, bringing bliss to our hearts. We shout and sing with ecstatic joy over your breakthrough for us. Join with us now as we sing and shout with joy in our worship time together.
As I pray. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, this morning we come before you in our homes with our families to gather in worship. We declare this morning that you are a gracious and compassionate God who loves to satisfy the desires of every living thing, that you are righteous in all your ways and faithful in everything that you do, that you love those who fear you, who put their hope in your unfailing love. So this morning, Lord, in this time of turmoil, I pray that we will turn to your word to light the way, that your word will, in, will illuminate our path, telling us to be strong and brave, to not be afraid, to lean on the everlasting arms, to trust in your ability that has seen us safe in the past and will see us safe in the future as well. Lord, at this time, help us not to be fearful. Let us understand that fear is a device of the evil one, that we need to use the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith as our armory to fight for our faith at this time. I pray that you will continue to bless us as a church family. May we continue to find creative ways to worship, to continue our Bible study, to maintain our connection with you and with one another. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for us. We so appreciate your presence in our everyday. Bless our homes, bless our families. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Hi, kids. Are you afraid of anything? 
Is there something that sends little goosebumps down your arms or little tingles down your back? Perhaps it's thunderstorms or big hairy spiders or just simply the dark. Do you want some mum and dad's room when the thunder cracks or when your bedroom is just that little bit too dark? I can only imagine that that spot between mum and dad is the best place to hide. You'd feel so safe and so warm. Or if you're a little older like me, you might sit there and close your eyes and try to block out the sound of thunder or picture light in the dark. There are times when fear takes complete control over us. It makes us hide under the blankets or trumps us from conquering our day. In the Bible, God says, Do not be afraid, for I am with you always, wherever you go, in whatever you do. Have you heard of Elisha? The Bible tells the story of how an army of soldiers and chariots were coming for him, Elisha and his servant. The servant looked out and saw this huge army coming and started to get afraid. Fear completely took over him. And Elisha knew that this was the time to stop his servant from hiding and from closing his eyes. Elisha prayed to God that he would open his servant's eyes and take away that fear because Elisha knew that God had this completely under control. Get this, when the servant opened his eyes, he saw that the mountain was full of horses and chariots full of fire around Elisha. Yep, that was God's army. It's pretty cool. Sometimes when fear takes over us, we lose control. We don't know what to do. We hide under the blankets and we cover our eyes. We need to be like Elisha and remember that God has everything under control. He will protect us, watch over us, and take away our fears no matter how big or no matter how small they are. We just need to pray and ask Him. Hello, Parmata Church. It's hard to be in nature and not give glory to God. Why? Well, one of the reasons is in a nature you become aware of so many different ecosystems working together, not just toward survival, but toward the growth. Each tree, each drop of water, each leaf are part of the complex ecosystem with one aim, and that is giving glory to God. So it is also with our church as well. Our church is an incredibly complex system, and every single one of us is there to support that system. We are also invited as the part of that system to be not just wise stewards of our own good, but also to volunteer our time, our spiritual gifts, and to be generous givers. So I invite you to be generous in today's offering, which is for our local Permata Church. And the way through which you can give is through the e-giving app. Let's invest in our spiritual ecosystem so that we can go forward and grow in our purpose, and that is giving glory to God. Please bow your heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for reminding us there is not even one sparrow dying and that you're not aware of that. And much more than that, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for reminding us that we are worth so much more. Thank you for taking care of us. And help us to think what can we do in these days ahead of us while we have a faith that you're taking care of us. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask blessing for this humble offering that we're presenting to you and that you use it for the benefits of people around us. I ask this in precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome and happy Sabbath, everyone. It's uh, lovely to see you. I mean, I can't see you, but you can see me. And so you get the raw end of the deal, but it's lovely to be here anyway. You know, this is our third week now through uh, video broadcasting. And it's a little bit weird. I miss you guys. You know, I miss, miss you guys seeing you face to face. And if you're looking from anywhere else in the world or other churches and you've joined our feed today, just want to welcome you. Um, we live in a crazy time, uh, something I've never seen in my life. I thought I'd seen it all. 
um, but definitely hadn't. But you know, it's an it's exciting time as well. And I want to encourage you, if you need anything or if you have any questions, I want you to reach out. You can either reach out on our uh, website or our Facebook page and reach out. And, and Pastor Roger and myself, we've got great elders here and deacons who would love to just come and uh, answer any questions, any concerns you have. And if there's any you know, real needs that you have, please reach out because it's important that we don't think that we're alone. It's very easy for us to be isolated at this time. And what we perceive quite often becomes our reality. Okay, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk about the idea of what we perceive becomes our reality. But before we do that, I just want to ask that uh, we can pray and ask God to bless this time. Father God, I thank you that even though we are separated by distance, I thank you that even though we have this time where we're live streaming, but you will still bless us. Your time is nothing to you, Father. You are above time, and I just ask that you will bless that. As we open your world, word, help us to see what you want us to see, Father, not what we want to see. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. I've been a bit concerned of late by a lot of the conspiracy theories that are out there. Um, a lot of people um, looking at things, finding things, and trying to make up, you know, are this person's to blame or this person's to blame, or, you know, or the whole thing's made up for, for some unknown reason. And look, there will be people that will try to profit from any situation. Okay, but, you know, if we look for the devil under every rock, we're going to be looking down and not looking up. And so at this time, I want us to think about the idea that what we perceive becomes our reality. Because there's a lot of anxious people. I've probably had more people from outside my church groups um, come to me and ask me about faith and about you know, talk to me about their anxiety. Talk to me about what's really important in life. Probably more in the last month than I had ever. And, you know, God is, you know, God can make the best of any situation. But if you're feeling that anxiety, you know, um, I want to encourage you. Okay? What you're feeling is real. Firstly, it's important to understand that what we're feeling is actually real. What we're going through is actually real. You know, if you've lost your job, that's scary. You know, and we want to pray for you. Yes, this will, I, I believe this time will pass. Yes, I believe God is bigger than any virus and any recession or depression that we can go through. But what you're feeling right now when you're thinking, how am I going to pay the rent? How am I going to pay the mortgage? How are we going to uh, pay for the kids' school fees or things like that? Th those are real. Okay, so when I when I talk about anxiety, I'm I'm not saying that what you're going through is not real, but I want you to, you know, what we sometimes happens when we go through these anxieties is we isolate ourselves, we cut ourselves off. Especially men, we're very good at this. You ladies, you you're awesome with regards to if I have a problem, what am I going to do? I'm going to talk to someone about it, and that's healthy. And that's good. Us men, we've got to keep it inside because we've got to be macho. We've got to be masculine. But that's not healthy. And quite often it bottles up and moves around to a point where we're really struggling. But I also want to talk to you about this idea of perception today. Because it's very easy to see what's going on and to think it's hopeless. To see what's going on and to see, you know, there's, there's no end in sight because we can't see the end, but God can, and God has a plan. And more than that, I am convinced that God not only has a plan, but he's actually going to work a miracle. He's going to work a miracle. And if you're here today looking for that, that something in life, and you're going to connect with God, that's the greatest miracle. Us connecting with God can be the greatest miracle. I want to talk to you about this idea of perception. This is a face mask. I wear this every night when I go to bed. 
okay, because I read somewhere about sleeping. I used to have a problem with sleeping a little bit um, at night, a bit of insomnia. But I decided to get one of these face masks. It's a really nice face mask, you know, it's got padded things for your eyes, it keeps it off your eyes and that sort of thing. But it's really good and I noticed a difference when I sleep with it and without it. Because the eyes are a gateway to our brain. Okay? And it tells us, you know, when it's day, when it's night, our eyes tell us that, you know, and we notice that if we can't. But I wear this at night because it, you know, it helps me to, it convinces my brain that it's black, that there's nothing to distract it and there's no reason for it to wake up. And I've noticed a, 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 a difference, a noticeable difference with sleeping with my eye mask and without it. So with that, it's really interesting. Also, if I have a really late night, for some reason, if there's a, a meeting or, you know, Bible studies or whatever reason, I have a really late night, get home late, um, and I can have a bit of a sleep in the morning, I'll definitely wear that because it means that I will sleep to my alarm because my eyes tell me, the eyes tell us when the sun's come up. You can, you know, it's, and that's why shift workers, you know, it's really important for them to have that blacked out sleep if they have to sleep during the day and work at night because your eyes tell your brain what time it is and your, and your brain regulates your body's uh, rhythms and uh, those sort of things. So it tells you where you're at. But our eyes can deceive us. I, I love the text in Ephesians 6 where Paul says, we do not fight against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers. So in other words, there's this, there's this realm or this uh, different um, spectrum of things that we can't see. There's things that are going on that we don't know. In fact, all through the Bible, we see the, the Bible telling us about this battle, the battle, and you are the prize for the battle. You are what the battle is for. Okay? And you have God who wants a relationship with you. You know, who wants, you know, worship is this idea of us coming and, and worshipping God for who he is and, and connecting with him. That's what God wants. The enemy just wants you not to worship God. The enemy just wants you not to connect and re relation. You know, the devil doesn't care that you don't worship him as long as you don't worship God. And so it's really important to understand that. And in, in 2 Kings chapter 6, it's one of my, I love this story, it's one of my favourite stories in the Bible. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we see this idea of perception and how if our perception can be opened, it can change not only our lives, but the world around us. And it starts off in 2 Kings chapter 6, and we're going to start off in verse 8. It says, Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his office, he said, I will set up a camp in such and such a place. So he, he's, he's, he's at war with Israel and he says, look, instead of going into full-on battle, instead of going down and, you know, it's costly, you know, people, our men will die, instead of doing that, I'm just going to ambush the king. We know where the king will be going We'll set up an ambush there. If we can kill the king, the next king might serve us rather than, you know, be, be a pain. So he did. He, he went up and to set up cases. But the Bible says that the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the, the prophet here which is Elisha, is telling the king, don't go there because the king's going to, the other opposite king, your, your enemy is going to be there and he wants to ambush you and he wants to kill you. Well, the king of Israel took his advice, saw that the king, had, the king of Aram had set up this ambush and so he avoided that place. And the king, the, the king of Aram was so angry because he thought someone has betrayed him. There's a rat. 
there's a rat in his ranks and someone's betrayed him and sent word to the king of Israel. And so he talks to his officials and he says, you know, which one of you, tell me now, which one of you has betrayed us? Which one of you has betrayed your people by telling the king of Israel this thing? And they said, it's not us. It's not us, sir, but we promise. And then one of the officials says, look, there is this prophet. There is this prophet and what is the God is telling him and he is telling the king of Israel not to go to that place. The king goes, fine, I'm going to send an army, small army, I'm going to send an army to get this prophet. Because you see, where Elisha was living, there was no defences. You know, the defences were in the big cities. And the whole idea was that if a, 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 an army came and defeated the city, they defeated the surrounding areas. But Elisha is in one of those surrounding areas. And so they find out where Elisha is and they go down there at, and, and at night and they surround that city. And the Bible says this. I want you to imagine this for a moment. When the servant of the man of God got up, he went early in the morning and the army with horses and chariots surrounded the city. So he's taken off his eye patch. He's got up, he probably opened the curtains and then cannot believe what he sees. And it's surrounded. He can, you know, they're all around the place. And he's thinking to herself, himself, what do we do? In fact, he goes to, the, to Elisha, to the prophet, and he says, what do we do here? What do we do? The prophet says, do not be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And he's looking at the prophet and he's going, look, there's one, two, there's two of us. This is an army. This is actually a, quite a big army because they've got horses, they've got chariots. You know, this is a, a serious force that's come against, come against them. And he's thinking, no, I think I'm going to die. I don't care what you say, Elijah, I think right now I'm going to die. And then Elisha prays this prayer. And Elisha prayed, <clears throat> O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So there was the army of the enemy around, but then all around them was an even bigger force of chariots and horses but these were these were angels these were you know they were on fire ready to protect them at this time we have this showdown and all of a sudden elisha is is in the midst of it but he he knows who he has he knows who he has on his side he knows who he has who's got his back. And he wants the servant to share in that moment. He wants his servant to understand that, yes, look, there is an army there. But look who you've got behind your back. And this, this is what, this is what we're going to fight with. The enemy came down towards him, and Elijah prayed to the Lord this. So he's prayed for his servant's eyes to be open to see. But then the, the, the army comes down and Elisha says to them, Lord, please strike them with blindness. And so the servant's eyes are opened, but the army, the enemy, they've been blinded. Their eyes have been blinded now. And so he goes out to them and he says, who are you looking for? And they're in this, there is the moment where they're totally vulnerable, totally vulnerable. They can't see, they, they, you know, and soldiers, you know, they've got, they've got a sea to be able to fight. They've got a sea to be able to shoot the arrows or to ride the horses or to use their swords. Now, all of their skills, all of their strength now is worth nothing because they can't see. Their reality is they are completely vulnerable. 
And he says, who are you here for? They say, we're, here, we're looking for a man, the man of God. And he said, he's not here, but I'll take you to him. And so he led the army. I guess they're kind of, you know, those trust exercises where they're walking with the, with the hands or, or they're, they're just leading the horse from behind and in front somehow. And he leads a whole army to Samaria. So instead of the, the, this little, little town where Elisha was, where they thought, no defense, we can go in, we can get the man easy. All of a sudden now they're in Samaria which is the city, and it has a big wall. It has defences. The, the army of Israel is here right now, the whole army. And not only that, he leads them into the city. He leads them into, you know, they're vulnerable. They've got no choice to follow this man. And as he leads them into the city, when they're all in, In verse 20, it says, After the enemy entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so that they can see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they looked. And where they were, they were inside Samaria. All of a sudden now, they're in the city. They're surrounded by the walls. They're surrounded by the enemy army. You know, and I guess there's this idea of like this standoff. But they know that they're, they're in trouble. Because they're surrounded and they're, they're again totally vulnerable at this situation. The king of Israel sees this and he goes, Elisha, well done. He says, can I kill them? In other words, he's saying, you know, give me the word and we'll slay them all down. You know, this will be a great victory and this will teach that king of Aram. This will teach him to mess with Israel. But Elisha says, no. He says, don't kill them. He said, would you kill men you have captured with your own sword or bow? In other words, you haven't delivered them here today. God has. And God has actually delivered them for something greater than your victory. So many times our perception is what we're going through right now. So many times our perception is is limited to our feelings, our pains, our hurts, these sort of things. And they're real. Again, what we're saying is these things are real. But quite often these real things skew our perception of what's happening outside of our life. And so these men, Elisha's Elijah, saying to the king of Israel, no, 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 no. God's got something greater And so he says to them, set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and go back to their master. So don't kill them, but put on a potluck potluck lunch. Put on the good food. We're going to kill the fatted gluten. We're going to get all the good stuff, you know, the, 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 the best petriti and things like that. Put them out in front of them so that they may eat and that they may drink and they may go back to their master. And they did. And so they prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away. And they return to their master. Now listen to this. Don't miss this bit because this is the crux of what God wants to do in our lives. So the bands of Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. I want you to think for a moment. What would have happened if the king of Israel had, had slain that army, the army of Aram? What would have happened at that point? I believe what would have happened is the king of Aram would have got really angry and says, right, you're going to kill them, I'm going to show you. And so there would have been this this feud going on. So many times we see feuds between people and it goes down generation upon generation. We see, you know, countries where they're the same families that have been separated by a border or a line and they hate each other. You know, we talk about state of origin, Queensland versus New South Wales, you know, but we don't hate each other. Well, 
maybe for three nights in the year. No, we don't hate, we don't hate them. But, you know, there's this feud, like, and we don't even know why. We don't even know why we hate that person. So many times this is because this person, instead of creating a connection, instead of creating peace in the relationship, they created war. Or they said, I'm going to finish this, I'm going to show you. And their pride took over, rather than reconciliation. You know, I was very impressed when Kevin Rudd got up and said sorry. Sorry for how we had treated our Aboriginal people for all those years. I was very impressed. I was disappointed that John Howard hadn't done it years before that. But I was very impressed when Kevin Rudd, because that was him saying, you know what, we have to stop this animosity between us because we we're all Australians. And your culture is my culture, and we want to learn your culture, and we want to be connected to you. He tried to create peace and reconciliation rather than war. We see from this story what God wants in our life. God wants us to have peace. He wants us to have reconciliation. He wants us to, in a time like this to see what's really important in our world, to see what's really important with what we're going through right now. And so I look at this story and the first thing I see, the first point I make to myself is that I need to open my eyes to the miracles that God is doing in my life right now. Just like the servant didn't see the, the fiery army that was around him that had his back, I don't see the fiery army that's around me. And I don't see the miracles that God does in my life every day. I remember when it was 1997 when I was in Papua New Guinea. I was there for a, a year. And I was able to see miracles. I was able to see things, God doing physical and spiritual miracles at that time. And I think a lot of it was because I was able to actually slow down. I was able to actually stop. And I was able to actually see the miracles that God was doing in this world. We live in such a fast pace, you know, that it's actually a great thing now that I want you to think about actually stopping at the moment and opening. And I want you to pray to God, God, open my eyes to the miracles that you are doing in my life. If you've lost your job, I want to pray for a miracle because we can't be brave unless we're scared. Bravery happens when fear is around. I love The Lion King, the movie The Lion King, and, and uh, Simba's talking to, to Mufasa, and he says, you are so brave, you are always brave. You know, you're never scared. And he goes, no, 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 I'm only brave when I need to be brave. Fear is a real emotion. Fear tells me that there's something in my life that's not right. If you're afraid of heights, you know, fear tells me when I come to the cliff not to step off. But being brave can't happen unless there's fear. Being brave can't happen unless there's this, this anxiety. And so if you've got that at the moment, I want to encourage you to be brave for the Lord is with you right now and open your eyes God open my eyes open my eyes to see the miracles that you are happening I'm you know I was talking to um, one of our workers and I was saying I believe God is going to work a miracle you know people are scared and stressed about you know finances people are scared and stressed about us returning you know tithes and people losing their jobs and things like that they're actually concerned for people's lives and i said god's going to work a miracle i believe god's going to work a miracle trust trust that he will inspire them but first we've got to stop 
and ask God to open our eyes to see what's happening. Take a minute. Take 10 minutes. This is something that I've learned that I do now and it's really, really helped me. My psychologist, or my, my psychologist you know, asked me to do this and I, I, I do it every day now. 10 minutes every morning and 10 minutes every evening. I think of things to be grateful for. Think of things to be grateful for. I was uh, um, at a presentation uh, end of last year and a presenter was there and talking about um, uh, mental illness and things like that and things that we can do to combat you know, those anxieties and those depressions. And she says there's three things that we as a culture have, have lost because of the culture that we live in. First, we're not mindful. And they talk about mindfulness, they talk about gratefulness, and they talk about an idea of disconnecting from social media. There are three things that they're suggesting for people who are struggling with this time. And I said to her, I said, you know what? It's really interesting you talk about that. I said, because as Christians, you know, we believe in prayer. You know, prayer is about stopping about being mindful, mindful of my situation, mindful who, of who I am with this mighty God that's with us, who, I am, who he is and what he's doing in my life. I'm grateful everything I have comes from God. And so in prayer we have this, and it's also this idea of disconnecting from social media. You know, I say, for me, that's the Sabbath. And ever since that, I now have a Sabbath from social media. I turn off my Facebook, my Instagram. I don't look at those. I don't, I don't look at those from sunset Friday night to sunset Sabbath. And I want to encourage you to do that, those three things. Interesting, as I was telling her this, she said, that's excellent. She goes, why aren't you doing it? Why aren't more Christians doing it? She says, you've had this for thousands of years. Why aren't we doing it? And I said, absolutely, I totally agree. Be mindful. At least 10 minutes every morning in gratitude, just being grateful for the things that you have. Spend some time in prayer every morning, every evening, as Daniel did, as Daniel did when he was in his isolation. And disconnect. I, I believe there's never been a more important time for us to have the Sabbath and to hold on to this gift than now. This is so important for us to hold on to this, this cherished blessing from God, the gift that he's given us from Sabbath, to actually disconnect and take that time. The second thing is we need to close our eyes. As, as Elijah, Elisha prayed for the armies, to be, their eyes to be closed, we need to sometimes close our eyes to all the, the, the stuff that gets us ang anxious and riled up. It's very easy, you know, I could sit, I could sit back and watch the news all day now and talk about um, COVID-19, COVID-19, COVID-19. But I don't do that. I specifically don't do that. So I've made a rule with myself that I'll only watch the news once a day. So if I watch the news in the morning, I don't normally because normally my mornings are pretty busy. But if I watch the news in the morning, I won't watch it at night. And if I, watch, if I watch it at night, I won't watch it in the morning. Because it's okay to be up with events. But if we keep getting all that negative things, if we keep getting all that negative stuff coming in, that will be our reality. What we perceive is what we see as reality. And so, you know, I encourage you to do that. You know, maybe just watch the news once, twice a day, max. Okay. Also, the conspiracy theories. I, you know, some of you have sent me videos and things like that, and I've said, look, thank you. I'm not going to open this, though, because I don't want to put that into my mind. Maybe some of it's true, but I don't need to know. I don't need to know because I know what God has. And God has warned me that these things will happen. And remember, his prophecies are there to show us in a world of confusion, he is still in control. And so that's all I have to realise. You know, whether this was made in a laboratory or, you know, a weaponised, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Because God 
is still in control. God tells me he is in control now and in the future. Lastly, what I want to leave you with today, the third point, is remember that who we have for us is far greater than who is against us. Yes, we have this virus and it's scary. And I am concerned and I'm, um, I guess, aware of the need to protect our vulnerable people. And that's why I'm saying if any of you need us, if, even if you just need me to go to the shops and get you some things, please let us know. Because our vulnerable people, this is something that's very real. So be smart, but not fearful. Be concerned, but not scared. But remember that who we have for us is greater than who we have against us. You know, the fiery army was there for Elisha. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to go to Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 32 verse 7. And it says this, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, because the king of Assyria and the vast army with him, from there, sorry, for their power, a great power is with them, and it, but the greater power is with you. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord of God to help us in the fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said. Hezekiah is seeing this great Assyrian army in front of him. And he says, do not be scared. Because yes, they have a great army. But their army is just flesh. Yes, this virus is, is it's a battle. And it's, and it's scary. But it's just a virus. It's very real, but it's a virus. God is greater in this time. Romans 8. Something we, we sometimes forget the seriousness of what the times of Paul and the disciples were writing their letters in. You know, they were either uh, you know, sent in jail to islands of Patmos or they were in jail about to be persecuted. But in Romans chapter 8, Paul says this. It says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us. That's what God is willing to give for us. He's willing to, to, to give up his own son. And he is for us. How will we not also, along with him, graciously give us all things. Now this is not what I want, but it's what I need. Okay? Because remember, what we see, what we perceive, can quite often tell us what we want. And it's amazing, I, I see a lot of people talking about things like, my whole, my priorities have changed. I no longer care about having the latest uh, phone, or the latest car, or the latest cricket bats, or, or these sort of things. Our priorities change because we know that, hey, God will give us what we need. If God is for us, who can be against us? And our last text today is in 1 John. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. He is going along here. John is talking to the church here and saying the same things Elisha said to his servant that day. He says, you dear children are from God and have overcome them. He's talking about the spiritual warfare. He's talking about these evil spirits. He's test the spirits, you know, test them by the truth, by the word. But he says, you have overcome them because the one who is in you, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The one who is in you church is greater than the one who is in the world so I want to encourage you today as we go through this next week together as we're getting used to being in isolation and staying away from each other I want to encourage you first open your eyes to the miracles that are around you to the things that God is doing 
in your life. Pray, because I believe God is going to work a miracle. Secondly, let's close our eyes to the stuff that we don't need to see. Let's spend our time in prayer. Let's spend our time in God's word. Things for over 2,000 years have been proven to be right and to make a difference in our world. And three, remember who has our backs. Remember who is with us is far greater than anything this world can throw against us. And we might fight against principalities of powers, things sometimes we can't even see, but God has won the battle. God has won the battle and wants to create a miracle in our lives. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for every eye that is watching this feed now. I want to pray for them specifically. You know who they are. I want to pray that you will bless them. I want to pray that you will um, put a miracle into their lives, Lord. There are people watching this that have lost their jobs, Lord. There are people, I guess, in the same boat as us that are, are worried about what the future holds for their jobs, Lord. I want to ask that you will give them a sense of peace, that you will open their eyes to who has their back and that you can create miracles in their lives. Lord, I want to pray for all our, our vulnerable. I want to pray that you will keep them safe. I want to pray for our, our pastor, Pastor Roger, and his family, Lord, as he, as he leads this church at this crazy time. Please, please be with him and his family, and thank you for the leadership. Thank you for our elders. But Lord, right now, may we stop and may we see how much you love us and that you have got our backs and you are greater than anything this world can throw upon us. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Be blessed.